Ascension is not about feeling and realizing you're a victim. It is exactly the opposite. It is about feeling absolutely empowered and knowing the impact that you have on the world around you and that you can have and that you actually are controlling so much more of it than you ever could have imagined. You're just doing it through your lens through which you see the world. If we want to change the world, change the way we perceive the world. This is the deep dive with Adam Roa. What up, deep divers? My name is Adam Roa. I'm your host. We're here for another episode of the deep dive. This one is really special for me uh, because Robert Edward Grant is here in the building, in the house digitally. And uh, man, we're going to explore this question of who built the pyramids and why? Like, what is the purpose of the pyramids? And uh, we were talking before this, actually, because you and I were on a trip to Egypt with mm-hmm. Nassim Haramein and, and mm-hmm. the Resonance Academy four years ago. And we had essentially one powerful conversation. Um, <laughs> and, and that just stuck with both of us. And I think that we had a little bit of maybe text messages back and forth over the last mm-hmm. four years, where mm-hmm. I even said to you at one point, I said, I feel like our paths are going to cross again. Yep. And I just don't know when. And then you said, Hey, you could come down to, and I was like, well, I'm not there right now. And it just, it never worked out. And then here we are about to embark on another trip to Egypt that you as like the modern day Indiana Jones that you've become are, are spearheading to follow the lost or not lost the hidden maps of Leonardo da Vinci. Mm -hmm. It's we'll get into all of this, but first I want to say how much I appreciate you and, and how deeply I have watched your journey take go so crazy and i and i and i just value the fact that we're getting to have this conversation robert i'm so excited me too and, and that our paths have crossed again so thank you for coming on the deep dive well thank you for inviting me it's uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you you know that that conversation we had happened to be probably the most impactful conversation that i had while i was in egypt and it happened to also be the last you know, 20 minutes that I was in Egypt before I left to go to the airport. If you remember, we we're sitting out under the stars by the poolside. And I and, said, um, I said, I was like, we just, I, I would love some time with you yeah. before you leave. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was a hugely impactful. And I remember you did a, you did a short video, like about, I don't know, maybe three or four months after that. And, uh, and you referenced that conversation without referencing, you know, by name or anything. But I remember it very well. It was a very impactful video that, that you did and kind of like provocative, making people think about you know, who they are and why they're here. And I think that is the core of the question of who built the pyramids and you know, for what purpose. So before going into that, because I, I do want to dive into that and everyone's like, get into that. I want you to just give us the 90 second, who is Robert Edward Grant? Um, because your career, <laughs> what, what you would have answered four years ago is very different than what is now. And so in your own words, uh, essentially, wh- who are you? Why should people, why are you speaking about this topic? You know, first of all, um, <laughs> the reason why I was in Egypt in the first place in that meeting with you is because Nassim had invited me to give a presentation there on my work across mathematics. Now, I spent most of my career in healthcare. I spent most of my career as a CEO of uh, public, you know, large publicly traded companies and even big pharma CEO, which is sort of like, you know, people ask me all the time if I'd gone to reform school or something after that, you know, it's like, I just couldn't be evil anymore type thing. And I went to like an AA for CEOs or something. No, that didn't happen. (laughs) But, but in a way I do kind of laugh about it now because actually I think that, you know, I am dramatically um, repositioned as, as far as even how I see myself after that trip to Egypt, it had a huge impact on me. But I was, you know, I don't consider myself even a mathematician. You know, now I have this book that is uh, called Philo Math that's been number one. It's been out for five months. It's still number one on Amazon for number theory and, uh, and geometry. But I don't even consider myself a mathematician. I consider myself a human being who's just learning the language of the universe. And I see the world around us as full of pattern. 
And I've always seen it that way. I just never allowed myself to really pursue that. So after, you know, 25 years in the medical and the pharmaceutical industries, I decided to explore that more significantly. And I started my own group of companies back in 2012. We now have 16 companies in that group. Uh, two of my companies right now are going through public offerings, which is kind of nuts. Like I've never been more busy in my whole life. But the thing that I love about my days is the stuff I'm doing related to math and Egypt. And it's, it's totally changed my life. And I really think that the main reason why we're all here is to remember who we are. And that has been the biggest soul searching journey of my entire life. And I think that it all culminated in my first trip to Egypt in 2017 with you. Yeah. So you, to, I'm going to synthesize that down for people here. It's just like, you have been incredibly successful in the like traditional model of whatever. And, and whether that people see big pharma as evil or whatnot, regardless, you've been incredibly successful as CEO in that world. And then you came, I remember listening to one of your lectures in, um, on that trip in Egypt. And you were talking about basically a new, like new math, like you discovered like new numbers Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know that was possible. That was the thing that drove. I thought math was this finite system that could get more advanced within a finite system. And I'm going, wait, you discovered new numbers. There's new numbers out there. I just didn't under, it didn't it sounds comprehend. So funny. It sounds so funny. And trust me, I, I, every once in a while, even my closest of friends like ridicule me over it. I got roasted one night and that was that topic came up, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, we well, found new numbers, too. So <laughs> um, let me let me put that in context for a moment. So I had always been a musician. I was a musician until, you know, I decided I was no longer a musician. And it wasn't that I stopped being a musician. It's just that I stopped telling people I was a musician. The reason I stopped telling people as I, I was a musician is because I came back. Uh, you know, I was 20, 21 years old. I came back from being a missionary of all things in, in South Korea. So I learned uh, the Korean language and, and I had had a music scholarship up until I left to go be a missionary. And then, you know, it was time for me to come home and I still wanted to participate in music, but I knew what that it wasn't going to be my career. I played trumpet. So I, I had a full performance scholarship at, uh, at Brigham Young University. And so I was not, you know, I was here, I was in this very strict Mormon religion, right? Extremely strict. And I have no regrets about it. I'm not Mormon anymore, but I, everybody has their own journey that they choose for their various reasons. And it relates to the same patterns that we find ourselves uh, experiencing over and over and over again, until we remember fully who we are. Mm -hmm. And, and then we learn to accept and love instead of judging. And so here I was at that time, and I judged that someone who was a musician may not be perceived as being serious about life. So I took something that I was very passionate about and put it away. And I said, even though I had a scholarship and everything, and I was good enough to get a scholarship at a, you know, at a really large university, I knew that I wasn't, at least I thought in my mind, it wasn't likely that I was going to be able to sustain a family on that or have a real career out of it. So I quit. And I never told anyone I was a musician because musicians could be perceived as sort of like, you know, you know, the term, like, oh yeah, he's a musician. I, I get it. Definitely. Yeah, I, totally. I get it. <laughs> right. So oh, he's an artist. Like, he's an artist. What, right? He's an artist. And sure. In 1990, being an artist and being, you know, there are different periods of time throughout the world where artists would be revered and really looked up to. But at that point in time, coming out of university, it, it just wasn't that time unless you were like main stage, right? You, if you're like Michael Jackson or something in that time, you're like total, total stud rock star. But the number of people that could actually matriculate to that level was so minuscule. So I decided to put it away, but it was always there. It mm -hmm. was always there. So when I started looking at, uh, at mathematics much later in life, I mean, I was always good in it. You know, I went to MBA school and I had to do well in the GMAT and all that stuff. But when I started looking at mathematics in a different light, I looked at it from really two angles of perspective that I had not looked at it before from. One was entirely musical. 
So all the musical intervals, the mathematical intervals of music, I thought must have some direct correlation because the entire universe is vibration. And so therefore you could say it's one verse of one giant song, right? So if it's all vibration, it's a carcophony or a symphony, right? That's constantly playing. And you could say that it's marking time through the music too. The time itself is what's marking these different intervals of music and time. So I, I looked at it that way, first of all. And then secondly, I looked at it purely from a language perspective. So I speak eight languages fluently. I lived in Korea, so I learned Korean. Then I got home and I, and I wanted to learn Japanese and Japanese and Korean were very similar. So it was quite easy to learn Japanese from Korean language. Well, if you know Japanese and Korean, then you have to study the Korean Chinese characters, which would be called Hancha or Hanmun, right? In, uh, in, in, in Japanese or Kanji, right? In Japanese, Hanmun in Korean and, and then Kanji in Japanese. So I started to, to study these different languages and I took classical Chinese classes and everything. And I was very fascinated by language and the concept of language. And then I went to MBA school and I did a study abroad in France. So I learned French and then I learned German because I lived in Germany for three years. And then um, I was responsible for an R&D team when I started my, you know, came back out of MBA school into my career. And I ran an R&D team in Israel. So I learned Hebrew. And, and so I already spoke Spanish because my mother's family is from there. So I was like, you know, all of a sudden, kind of very, very multilingual. And I learned a process for how to learn languages, which is really interesting because I, I didn't learn it through Rosetta Stone. I didn't take any of that kind of Rosetta language learning approach. I created my own system. And I started by listening to the words I would hear the most often. And so, you know, the words you hear the most often in France would be like, mais oui, tout à fait, pas bien sûr right? Which are all different ways of saying the words, of course. But when you live in Germany, the first words you learn are verboten, which means forbidden, right? The first words you learn are genau, which means exactly or exactitude. And you can tell a lot about the cultures, right? Between the differences between French and Germans, you know, you, you go to France, you drive around the Arc de Triomphe, there's no lines on the road. There's like 12 different rows of cars. It's like a complete mess, Right. <laughs> Whereas in Germany or Switzerland, it's even more so the case. If you speed through a, you know, a red light, the people that are there will actually write down your license plate and turn you in, right? It's a very sort of like, you have to be very, very clear about what's forbidden and what's allowable. You know, mm -hmm. the moment you land at Frankfurt airport, they have, you know, big paint writing on the side of a hangar that says verboten. You get to the, you get to get your rental car. And the first thing it says is, you know, das Parkplatz is verboten. That parking place is forbidden, right? So everything was forbidden. So I'm like, well, geez, you know, there must be something really strong in this culture about that. So I took a language learning perspective to culture. And then once I learned the system for learning languages, which usually starts with verbs, you have to know the verbs of action, right? And you can't learn a language. I realized that without 2000 verbs, Right. Most people learn English as a foreign language. Right. If you've heard of TOEFL. Right. You've been all over the world. So people all want to learn English really well. Well, the first thing they do is study a ton of nouns. I did the exact opposite. I studied the verbs. I wanted to understand verbs and conjugation of verbs because I knew everybody had already understood all the English nouns. And so I could always just say words like computer in their language, computer. Right. And they would understand it if I was in Japan. Right. And so I went for the verbs. And when I started looking for the verbs, I realized that that was the key to the language that you could learn and you could communicate if you knew 2000 verbs. So I had this whole program that I called 2000 verbs, get to 2000 verbs. So then I started looking at mathematics. And very quickly, I realized that math is a language. So then what are the 2000 verbs in math? And exactly. what I realized is that the way that mathematics and the universe does its verbs, we, we append an ing on the end of a noun like the word text. We say texting, right? Texting. I'm texting someone. Or in French, you could say, je suis en train. I'm in the middle of doing, I'm in the train of doing some task, right? What I realized is that that appendage of ing in mathematics is replaced with an irrational tail, hmm. like pi. So what is pi? It's a verb. 
pi is how we circle, we are circling a diameter, right? And so the way that it performs that verb action is by appending an infinite irrational tail on the end of it, like 3.141592653, right? All the way out to infinity. It's an incomplete action. It never finishes. So when I started looking at mathematics as language, it changed everything. Because then the next thing was I started thinking, well, what are the other 2000 verbs? I know pi. So I wanted to study all the math constants. I took the same approach of language learning to mathematics. And what came out of it has been dramatic, right? Just totally dramatic. And it's, it's led to many, many, many discoveries of which, you know, many of them now are in my book, Philomath. And it, it helps people learn math in an entirely different way when you look at it as a language, because now you're just communicating with something or someone or some architect who maybe was involved in its creation in the first place. <laughs> wow. Okay. So this is, <laughs> this is, this is where you and I actually, this is where we overlap because my skill set. what I tell people all the time is where my brain unlocks its superpowers is in pattern recognition. Yeah. And, but how I, I see it as like the computer screen we're looking at right now. Um, there is the imagery. I see Robert Edward Grant as the person I know behind that there's the binary code. And both of those are true. They exist simultaneously on top of each other. One can't exist without the other really um, to some degree. And so right now, you figured out this language of the binary, like you've figured out the mathematical, because I consider that the same thing with reality. We look around at this reality, the trees or whatnot. To me, that's the images on the screen. And underneath that, there's a mathematics to it. Mm -hmm. And so you, um, your pattern recognition has gone into that like binary level of just seeing that. And I feel like my so superpower is really in the, imagery and the emotion. And that's why mine comes out in how I string together patterns of words. Uh, mine's how, how I um, like can ask certain questions because I feel the patterns of, of energy through like the person's experience, right? This, this empathic sort of, of way of being. And so for me, I feel like that's where I feel it's the overlap with you. And I said this to you on our, a phone, our last phone call, which was, I, I get lost trying to, to follow the, the mathematics. Although I have a belief that strengthening that is like strengthening your ability to code reality. Oh, yeah. And 100%. so, and so manifestation, everything, everything. And so the, the, how excited I am to learn more about this is not actually because I want to go and do these algorithmic things and, and be a, a philomath necessarily, but I see that it translates and we have one of the greatest examples of what can be done with an understanding of mathematics in the pyramids, the pyramids of oh, yeah. Egypt are that. And so to transition into this question and uh, like, what is the purpose of the pyramids? Who built the pyramids? And for everyone who doesn't know, just because Robert just dropped a bunch of stuff and, and you probably realize this dude's just a different human. It, his brain just works differently than most humans. However, what I will say is that Robert's also super normal. <laughs> like I've, I've met you, I've hung out with you. You're actually a cool dude. Like I could, I imagine you and I could have like a, just a great conversation on uh, with a glass of beer and just, totally. just kick it, you know? So it's not, I want everyone to understand that, that, that you walk this line that I don't see very often. Um, that's really amazing to me. And I, I want to, to have you speak to us about like who built the pyramids 
I want to okay. know. I want to know that because you become the Indiana Jones. Just so everyone knows, we are going on a trip. We're going to talk about this a little later in this this episode. But um, Robert has organized a trip to follow two hidden maps inside of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, and there is an opportunity for you to virtually come along with a virtual pass and be a part of this. So we're going to talk about that a little later in the episode. But for now, the real question is, who built the pyramids? Indiana Jones. Hey, okay. all right. So I want to say one thing first of all because I. To your point about having a connection and using the emotional aspect of it, I would say you're already an incredible mathematician. You just don't even recognize it as such. Any person who is as adept as you are in poetry is a mathematician. You are using, you know, different mathematical geometric forms in language. You just don't know that you're doing it, right? And you could say that that music is just geometry that we listen to. And by you know, the same token, you could say that geometry is just the music that we listen to with our eyes. And by the same form of that same sentence, poetry is exactly the same thing. It's another form. It's very close to music in my mind. You know, lyrics and, and poetry are very, very similar. Right. We're just putting a musical backbeat to it when we're doing it as a musical form. But as a poet, I mean, one of the greatest poets of all time, clearly William Shakespeare, he used a mechanism that was all based around a pentagon, pentagon, the pentagram, which is iambic pentameter. Right. And it's a whole method in the sonnets, the 14 lines of the sonnets. Right. And one plus four equals five. And so the whole thing is related to the golden ratio everything of it. So that, that's when you become a master at using that spoken word. You are, in essence, a mathematician. You just don't recognize it as such. And those same mathematical forms, those geometries are actually impacting us at subtle levels. We just don't necessarily realize it. We place so much emphasis on our sight as being our strongest you know, of our senses. But actually, there are you know, touch obviously is a very powerful one. Smell brings memories back. And it was horrible when I had COVID. I literally lost my sense of smell for about four or five months. And it was, I was so thrilling when I got it back. You know, the first thing that was funny about it is I lost my sense of smell for bad things. And I, I could still smell good things. I couldn't smell any bad things. So, you know, I have a two-year-old son and my wife's like, Can, could, why didn't you change his diaper? You know, I'm like, I, I didn't smell anything. I'm like, that's my story and I'm sticking with it, right? For as long as I can milk this one. Got it. <laughs> totally. Yeah. But, but really, you are a mathematician. You are. And um, I think what's happening now is people have hated mathematics in school. They just absolutely hated it. And, and now they're getting this love affair with it again because they're seeing it in a different way. This is a language of communication, synchronicities, angel numbers, all the stuff that you see day in and day out. A lot of it is numerical. The mm -hmm. language of the universe is mathematical and geometric. So I will then take that to the Great Pyramid. Well, first of all, you have this building that for over 4,000 years, even if you believe that it was built in dynastic times, and I, and I don't really subscribe to that, way of thinking. I think it's much, much older than that. And I have a lot of evidence that, that actually demonstrates that as well. But I, I, I won't go into that just at this point. But even if you do believe the historical record of you know, the dynastic Egyptians having built it, you know, Khufu or Cheops, as it's often also referred to, you have to look at this with incredible awe and wonder. Because it has, you know, almost two and a half million blocks. Each one of those blocks is between on the low end, probably seven tons on the high end, probably 40 or 50 tons in that kind of a range. You're talking about a huge structure that was the tallest building on planet Earth for over 4000 years. Now, today we will have like, you know, uh, the, the tallest buildings in the world. You know, people know Burj Khalifa. They know that at one point, the Empire State Building was the tallest or the Twin Towers were the tallest. Right. And then there's, you know, this building in Shanghai that's super tall. And you've got buildings in Kuala Lumpur, right? The twin towers that they have in Kuala Lumpur, that are very, very tall in Singapore. But can you imagine having one building that stood above them all for over 4000 years? That is amazing in and of itself. And it still stands today. 
right? And that's pretty incredible. So, and it not only does it stand, but it stands within one quarter inch of perfection from where it started out from. Mm -hmm. That's astounding. The amount of mathematical precision built into the Great Pyramid, you could say, is in fact a Rosetta Stone for all the verbs of the language mm -hmm. of mathematics. It's, it's something I'll, I'll share with people. I went to Egypt and... I thought I would get answers. I left with questions. I like they're, they're showing up there. I think that by seeing it on TV and all the shows that we watch and the photos that you see, it's, it's one of those things you have to see it to believe it. When I, the moment you, I walked up to the pyramids and touched one of the blocks, I went, there's just no way. Every, every single thing I think that I've been told about how these were built and all these theories, you see it and you go, there's just no way that that, that could have, it's, it left me with so many questions. It's, it's, it's an amazing place. And not only does it leave you with questions, but as you get deeper into it, I've been back several times since 2017. And every time I've gone, I have gotten more and more questions and entirely new avenues to go down. And we've made more and more discoveries. You know, I went back in 2018 and I, I felt like I had to go back after our trip in 2017. And we were there. Now, let's give the backdrop on this. We were there the same week as that mass shooting that occurred in Las Vegas in front of the mm -hmm. fake Luxor pyramid, where about 560 some odd, 586 people, I think was the number, were injured or killed, right, during that mass shooting. And we were at Giza Plateau, we were on Giza Plateau the exact same time that that was happening. And there were about 176 of us, if I counted correctly, and it's very interesting because it seemed like this bizarre mirror reflection. Here we were going through this, you know, incredibly expansion of con incredibly uh, consciousness expanding experience. And then on the other side of the planet, in front of a fake pyramid, we had, you know, 586 people being shot. And, and another weird thing about this is I look at numbers across everything. And if you take one over 176, it'll give you a number that has some zeros in front of it but 0 0.00, and then it's going to be um, 586. So it's exactly a mirror, a, an inverse mirror reciprocal value of the number of people that we were representing in on Giza Plateau at the exact same time. So mm -hmm. there's something about mirrors and our reality that I think really resonates. And even in order to really answer this question, because I can tell you, we've done a deep dive analysis on the Great Pyramid. And there are about, we only know, I mean, I made the point about 2000 verbs. You could, you could literally measure mankind's ascension and our understanding of who we are, as well as our place in the universe by measuring the degree to which we understand pattern versus randomness. So if if mankind could perceive all the patterns that underlie what we now term as randomness, because randomness is just really a word we use to describe something we don't understand. We it doesn't mean yeah, it's not pattern. So you're saying that there's a pattern to everything. Everything. If it appears to be random, it's just a more complex pattern than we've figured out how to put together. That's right. So for even one pattern to exist, I've, I've developed a random number generator. It's funny. I had dinner one night with... Uh, with Yurka, who is the CEO of Gaia, and and uh, his his uh, his significant other was there. Her name's Kimba, and she said to me something at dinner that like freaked me out. She goes, "Did you realize that your name's initials are the same as random event generator?" And I was like, "What?" <laughs> so I said, "Thank you. I'm going to be up all night staring at the ceiling now on that question alone." Because random event generator, that like really made me laugh and freaked me out at the same time. What I can tell you is that what we perceive as randomness and entropy, because that's the other word for randomness, is not, in fact, in my opinion, entropy at all. And I've even developed random number generators. It just is a boundary condition on our own ignorance, mm -hmm. a pattern that we haven't yet perceived. But it doesn't mean to say that the pattern doesn't exist. For there even to be one pattern in a sea of entropy, then that presupposes the entire sea is syntropic, not entropic. 
it must actually be fully patterned. We just don't perceive that pattern. It's beyond our level of comprehension. And you could say that every time we pass through higher dimensions of understanding and awareness, we're really passing through boundary conditions of entropy. So this, this ties into how I describe creativity to people, um, because my life is really devoted to creativity. And to me, I describe creativity as just your brain putting together a pattern it's never put together before. Right. That's, that's literally it. And so when I talk to people about, are you creative? It's your brain is constantly making it's, it's seeing and spotting patterns and making meaning out of the patterns that it sees. Right. And so when we're in a creative process, all I'm doing is asking my mind to put together patterns in a way that it has never put together before. And the moment that it clicks, I get how the next line of poetry is going to come together, or I get that the next notes on the trumpet or the guitar or whatever are going to come together. And so the the expansion of our own ability to pattern recognize is the expansion of our creativity and the edges of our creativity, meaning the edges of what we can pattern recognize are the edges of what we can create and manifest into our lives. And so all of this experience of developing a deeper understanding from either direction, right? Like, cause you can play the guitar and as long as you allow yourself to put notes in new ways and try new things, you're actually doing the same thing as sitting down and, and looking spotting patterns in math differently, like you said. And so we all have our entry point to it. And what I thought was so interesting that you, you started to speak about is that the pyramids in many ways are, are this like, I'm not even sure they're, they're like the, I'm, I'm seeing it as the um, guide, the key the book, the thing that says, Hey, all the patterns are here. Yeah. And so you can look at this and within this structure, you can find the patterns to, to possibly the entire universe. So I believe, first of all, the the pyramid, and we've proven this, in fact, that all the major known mathematical and physical constants are all embedded within the proportional dimensions of the great pyramid. We've proven that out to even physics constants, over a hundred math and physics constants that we know of. Now, it's probably that there are many, many more that we just simply don't know. But the entire universe is built upon geometric ratio, even down to the point where even the measurement systems themselves that we use are embedded within the proportional dimensions of the Great Pyramid, namely the foot for the imperial system, the meter, the cubit. They're all built into the proportional dimensions of the Great Pyramid. Now, of course, the cubit was the Royal Egyptian cubit. It's 1.718 feet. But that's kind of anyone who's a mathematician would know, well, wait a minute. That's kind of very similar to add one to that value, and it's 2.718. And that's the second most important mathematical constant that there is. It's called Euler number. So Euler and pi, pi is obviously the best well-known. In today's new age circles, most people would say the golden ratio would be the second best known. But actually, the, the most important of all the math constants besides pi would arguably have to be the Euler number. And gravity is determined by the Euler number. And light and transverse waves and how light spirals is determined by pi. So is the combination so- of the two is what gives us separation from light and darkness. The this, this separate, wait, hold on. Say that again. You just blew my mind for a second. I want to make sure we, we let that land. Okay. Because the, the Euler number mm-hmm. gives is connected to the speed of light because yeah. what you're talking about uh, when I hear a constant like that, which is an infinite tail mm-hmm. is a verb. Mm-hmm. So then anytime we have something like light, the movement of light, which is yep. always in action. Mm-hmm. Therefore, you would have a constant that's a part of that, the Euler number, right? Correct. It, mm-hmm. So, but then when you're talking about pi, tell me again now that's light. Now, how's the darkness? G- give me the. So, so light, when it travels, and, and that light doesn't really travel, what it does is it's kind of like the way I like to describe it when you think about light and how it travels, quote unquote, is when you're in a, in a football stadium and you go to a game and then they start doing the wave, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're not moving around, but the wave is moving around. 
you're staying stationary. You're just getting excited and then sitting down. You're standing up and then sitting down. But it looks like the wave is moving, right? It's the same thing with the way light goes. Each one of those photons is recreated as another reflection. As it goes around the wave, you could say then the backdrop must be in on excitation when it's in the center of the wave and off excitation. So think about when waves come over from Japan to California, the water molecules stayed in Japan. They didn't move. They just went up and down when the wave traveled through it. There was a wave perturbation that excited and went through it, right? And then it came all the way after an earthquake to the shores of California. So what happens is light, as it's actually going through this wave structure, is going to spiral. And the way it spirals is going to be according to pi. So that's a mathematical equation the universe is just doing naturally, right? It's following. So when light, quote unquote, travels in the way I just described, it's not going in a straight line. It's going like this, mm -hmm. like this. Now, what does Euler do? Euler makes squares. So Euler makes squares, pi makes circles. And the combination of the two creates a ratio. That ratio is Euler over pi and Euler to the power of pi. Now, Euler to the power of pi creates a ratio that is 1 over 0 0.0432. 1 over 432. Hmm. 432 is a hertz frequency that is standard, right? It's a Pythagorean tuning standard in music. And we use 440 hertz today. That's a whole nother on this so an avenue of my work. But what happens is for pi is not only is but it's all six four. And that eight six four happens to be the reason why we have eighty six thousand four hundred seconds in one day, happens to be the reason why the sun's diameter is eight hundred sixty four thousand miles. And all of these numbers then start to come to life. 864 is simply 432 times two. So this relationship of Euler and pi, Euler number was only discovered by Isaac Newton around the late 17th century, early 18th century. He was credited with it, even though it wasn't given his name. It's funny, it was given the name Euler because of a, a mathematician that was Swiss. His name was Leonard Euler. <laughs> and I always like to remember it this way because I speak German. Euler just means owl. Oil means owl in German. Well, an owl, and the Euler number is 2.718. So an owl's head will turn exactly 271 degrees on its axis. Mm. So what a coincidence that they chose a name that matches because an owl's neck can twist all the way around. We've all seen how owls can do that, right? Yeah. Well, its head twists that much. So if there were a speed limit for the universe, it would have to be the speed of light, right? The mm -hmm. speed of light would be the speed limit for the universe. But what's the speed limit to the speed limit? What's the governor over that speed limit? It's the Euler number. Hmm. Euler controls all wave propagation, maximum expansion. So when you have something like this, because again, for if anyone's like me, they hear this and they're like, okay. And I consider it, I'm, so I'm in Maui, Hawaii right now. And, and mm -hmm. one of my friends here, indigenous wisdom keeper for, for um, so many different lineages. And he was sharing with me some chants from the Hawaiian language. And I was recognizing that my, my brain wasn't able to hold on to it. The best I could, it was like going in one ear and then it was just like gone. And I was telling him how my interpretation of what was happening, because I've, I've, I've gone and traveled the world and, and have heard other languages and, and have picked it up a little easier than Hawaiian. And he was saying, and I was saying that the reason is because for me, the language is so it carries a different frequency because the way that you were talking about how German and French, you can feel the culture in it. Right. The language of Hawaiian is so guttural to, to like each sound and yeah. word can mean so many different things mm -hmm. and carry so much meaning that it almost goes against 
how my brain has processed reality for like the very linear, it needs to be this way, this way, as the, the words themselves and the sounds themselves mean so much more. It's like, wait, my brain doesn't work that way. I, I what's the word for the thing. Right. And it, and I noticed that just how that translated was, I just couldn't seem to hold on to it. And I get a similar experience with a lot of the, the math words I go, okay, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. And I can get the concept, like the way that you describe the wave that passing through, I can get that so much easier than understanding, okay, the 271, the one over the 432 and all of these things. So what is the, I want to translate this back to our question around the purpose mm -hmm. of the pyramids. So, so when we're speaking to what is the purpose of the pyramids, is it to carry this code? Like, is, is it to carry this code for us to, to discover, or is it, I, I had previously thought that it was, it was an, like a structure for energy for the, for the ability to, to basically blast out, receive and blast, like transmit frequency at a, a deeply high level. And I'm curious what you, what your perspective of the purpose is. So first of all, you know, going back to the analogy on language, I, I believe that the Great Pyramid houses in its dimensions and proportions, all of the knowledge required for us to be able to see the universe. So that's a very deep, strong statement, right? So if you're trying to leave information for the future, because to go to the effort of building a great pyramid, that's, a, that's an incredibly difficult task. No matter what kind of technology you're using, it's a tough task to take on. You have to want to do it for a real reason. And I don't think that, you know, to take that long, if I knew I was going to die in like 30 years, would I start today, right, building my gigantic epitaph? Probably not, right? I'm, I'm 52. I know at some stage I'm probably going to leave this earth, but I still wouldn't want to start building my cemetery place right now. Right. It's, it's and not have it in my face every day too. Right. Would you, <laughs> I mean, like literally like every, Oh yeah, that's where I'm going to die. That's where I'm going to go when I die. Right. No. And we should mention that they have not found any. They never found a single in, mummy in, in any those, pyramid like that. For people to know we, we've been, we were originally taught in school. They were built at these tombs or whatever. No mummies found in that. And it, as someone who's gone through the pyramid, kind of ridiculous. The idea yeah, there's yeah, not a no, bunch of cav there's not a bunch of rooms and caverns and and gold things there. Like it's not that. It's, no. it's just not what you would do for this big hall for burials and, and stuff. Because there are other tombs that are that and this is very different you know what the architecture of it reminds me of when i lived in australia i used to go to the sydney opera house and if you look at the ceiling in the sydney opera house where there's all these straight line ridges and everything it kind of like the way that your closet doors look behind you but the whole wall would be like that right you you start mm -hmm. to think about it and say well geez is this some sort of sound thing you know especially when you're walking through the grand gallery climbing up to get to the great step and into the king's chamber, mm -hmm. right? This the the walls are like coming in. There's like seven different indentations that come in, and then it kind of creates its own little pyramid on the ceiling, and it looks like it's something for sound, and it feels like you're walking up like a star portal. It does. It feels you're like you're, and it. It looks super advanced. It does not look like something that's old. It looks like arguably something that could be from the future, as much as it is from the past. 100%. And, and I don't know about you. I know my experience of that, that night, um, as I was walking up, I felt like I was in the word that's popping in my mind now is like an ascension ladder. Like I felt like yeah. I was in this timeless, if it felt very timeless to me where I was like, have I been here before? Am I having deja vu? Am I feeling the future? But it, it definitely felt like going up like a stargate or a star. It was very, very uh, surreal. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. So when I went back in 2018, I felt like I was on some real mission this time. I knew I was going to go back to discover something. And in fact, I'd been, you know, studying alchemy and hermeticism for months. And I even taught a course on it on resonance foundation. And it's called the etymology of number, looking at math as number, but it's also an alchemy course. So I teach about all of the different stages of ascension. 
by following hermeticism. So, you know, the Kybalion Emerald Tablets of Thoth and, and all of these things. Well, I, I knew going there that I was going to have a special experience because even the day before I left, I had gone through all the steps in alchemy and I was in my, uh, my parents-in-law's house and I went out to go grab something from the car. And is the moment I walked out to their front yard, there was a gigantic white egret, right? So it's one of those big white birds, right? That likes to eat lizards and stuff like that. Well, in Egypt, that bird is known as the Bennu, right? It's the Bennu bird. It's a, it's the bird of, of resurrection. It's the bird of, uh, of ascension and it's a Phoenix. Basically that's the, that's the word that they use for their form of Phoenix. So I saw this gigantic white giant white egret, like five feet in front of me and it didn't fly away. It was just walking around in the front yard. And I was like, Whoa. And I knew exactly because everything in alchemy is about seeing bird symbols, right? It starts off with the negredo, which is, uh, when you start to confront your shadow, right, and start having more awareness about who you are, the aspects of yourself that have not been consciously chosen, but subconsciously are there, right? Uh, and then you go into these different steps, which includes the albedo, the citronitas, which is a peacock. So it's, you know, the negredo is the crow. Then it goes to the, uh, the swan, then the peacock, then the pelican, representing sacrifice and the alchemical marriage. And then to the Phoenix stage, Phoenix stage is the last stage. So while I, you know, was watching this bird, I was thinking immediately, wow, something's going to happen when I go to Egypt tomorrow. And I was going to Israel first for a week. So I went to Israel first for a week. And the entire time I was there, I was drawing out Alpha Omega in my notebook. And I didn't know why. I just kept drawing it out, the proportions of it. And I was like taking pictures of it every day that week. And I had an incredible trip to Israel with about 12, I was like 40 of my friends that, uh, that all came from Orange County. And we had a very special tour there. And then at the very end, I was going to take 12 of those friends to Egypt with me. So when, when we got to Egypt, we went, through the king's, we went to the king's chamber and one of my friends was laying down in the sarcophagus, which I think everybody eventually has to do and experience. It's an incredible experience. So first of all, to give you the backdrop on this, the speed of sound is 343 meters per second. Okay. That's how fast sound travels. And when you look at the Great Pyramid, by the way, the speed of light informs not only the latitude, but the longitude are exact matches to both the speed of light and also the number of seconds in a day. How does that work? So the latitude of the Great Pyramid is 29.97. Uh, uh, so 29.97 uh, to 458 meters per second. So 29.9792458 meters per second. So that exact number, that is exactly the number that is right in the sarcophagus, the exact latitude reference of the Great Pyramid on planet Earth. Like to within one meter accuracy, which is kind of insane. How the heck did they pick that? Because the Great Pyramid, actually, one of the names of the Great Pyramid is light. So pyramid, light, would also be referred to in ancient times as fire. Pyra is fire. Mid is middle or like mean, right? The average. So the speed of light is exactly in the center of the sarcophagus. You've got to be kidding me. Within one meter accuracy. The longitude is... As a ratio, it's, it's 31.1342 degrees, right? And looking at the longitudinal reference, if we take that and divide it by 360 degrees, it comes out to 0 0.0864. There's that same 864 ratio that was related to Euler over pi that was also related to the number of seconds in one day, 86,400. So in the meter measurement, we have the latitude. And in the longitudinal measurement, we have time really mind-blowing. So, so it makes you ask the question, you know, when was the pyramid really built? Because there was no latitude when the pyramid was built. There was no understanding of latitude. So then you have to ask yourself the question, did they know this? Or was this pure coincidence? And the chances of landing on a number out of that many digits, 299-792-458, to land it exactly on that number 
and have it have the relevance of light speed and its longitude being a time reference, that's a mind blower right there. Well, so my spiritual awakening happened in 2013 uh, through ayahuasca and primarily through the getting to a point where there was so much that was shown to me that it hit a point where I went, it would be more illogical for me to think this is random. And so my logical yeah. mind said, the logical, the most logical thing is that there's, this isn't a coincidence. This is enough evidence for me to say there's some other force at play yeah. here. And that was actually my spiritual awakening was my logical mind going, okay, now I believe. And I, so my question for you is how much of this, cause I do believe as we do live in a mathematical universe that with enough searching, we can, we could take the proportions of my pillow and my thing, and we could find <laughs> meaning and, and different values and the, the Euler number here or pi here or whatever. How much of this is just, do you feel like is that, and how much of this do you feel like is entirely, entirely intentional? Well, rather than answer that question right away, let me give you a few more things and maybe you can come to those <laughs> answers more readily on your own as well. So going back to the speed of sound, right? The King's Chamber is made of granite. So the speed of sound is 343 meters per second. But guess what the speed of sound is when it's going through granite? The so, so sound waves go faster through dense media, right? So when sound travels through water, it travels much faster than it does through air, right? Because it's more dense than the air. So the speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second, but in water, it's 1,440 meters per second. Okay, so it's much faster, right? Mm. That's you know several times faster, more than four times faster going through water than it is going through air. So what about going through granite? What's the speed differential? Would you be surprised to know it's 17 and a half times faster through granite? So the speed of sound through granite inside that chamber, the king's chamber, is 6,000 meters per second. 6,000 meters per second. So you're literally in a sound chamber that is built, intended to resonate at certain frequencies. So when you lay inside that King's Chamber sarcophagus that is 55% made of quartz crystal, it literally resonates like this. All you have to do is find the right frequency with your voice and just go, hmm. It's like a mooing cow almost. And then it starts to go, it like turns on and it goes, whoa, 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 like super loud, like super loud. And everybody I've ever taken a picture of when they're doing this, every time the picture shows up is having a rainbow arc over their body. You can see it in the photograph, every single one. I've done it many, many times now. There is something I get to do very this on special. This trip? Do yes, I get to do this do. on the trip? Because I haven't gotten to do it. And this guys, virtually, if you want to be a part of this and see this stuff, we're going to talk about the virtual pass here. But I, I want to do this. Oh, yeah. So I, I here I was in 2018. And I'm looking down at the rim of the sarcophagus. Remember, the backdrop was I'd been drawing Alpha Omega in my notebook all week, not knowing why. And I had this flash, just like you said. When the first time you walked up the King's Chamber, there was like a moment of deja vu or something. I had an intense moment of deja vu. I actually remembered being in that exact same spot and watching two letters get pressed into the rim of the sarcophagus. Now, the pyramid is famously devoid of any writing to leave us any messages or clues on who the builders were, right? Because if we had hieroglyphics, et cetera, inside, maybe we could learn something about it. And, you know, obviously it could also be that people came after the fact, right? And did stuff to the pyramid. Who knows? The moment I remembered being there when these two letters were being pressed into the granite of the sarcophagus rim, again, this sarcophagus is made, 55% of it is, uh, you know, rose gold, it's, it's rose quartz crystal. And rose quartz, you know, there, there are two uh, gemstones for Taurus, and one of them is the emerald, the other is rose quartz. And the Taurus thing comes into play in just a moment, because I'll explain why that becomes very important. 
But basically, that chamber is so brittle, that little sarcophagus, right? It's 89.62 inches long, 38 and a half inches wide. That thing is so brittle that if you tried to chip a piece of that at the corner or something, the whole thing might actually crack. It's brittle. It's made of dolerite. It's the most, it's one of the most brittle stones on the planet, right? It'll literally fall apart. I had this memory of seeing an alpha omega pressed into the, uh, the rim of the sarcophagus. And the moment I remembered it, I looked in the spot I remembered and I could see the way the light was shining on it. I could see an alpha omega right on the rim. Now, I knew enough about the Great Pyramid. I'd studied it enough to know there was not any writing on the Great Pyramid. We knew this. There's a place that's right underneath the chevrons on the outside of the pyramid. There's some graffiti inside the pyramid. So when I saw this Alpha Omega, I was like literally astounded, like totally astounded, not knowing exactly what to do. So I grabbed Muhammad, who you know, Muhammad Ibrahim, and I said, Muhammad, come over here. And he freaked out. And he's like, did you make this? <laughs> I'm like, but yeah, just now I chipped it out. You know, I had a private thing in the pyramid. It only took me like 10 minutes and I made it mathematically perfect too, by the way. And let's talk about that mathematical perfection because I mentioned the sarcophagus is 89.62 inches long and 38 and a half inches deep or, or wide, I guess. And basically why that's important is that the room itself of the King's chamber is 10 cubits by 20 cubits. It's a rectangle. Right now, 10 by by 20 cubits turns out to be exactly in meters. Right. So 60 cubits for its perimeter, then, because you'd have 10, 20 and 20 and then 10 again. Right. For this rectangular shape, it turns out that the room itself is going to have exactly in meter measurement a length of thirty one point four one five nine two meters. So it's exactly pi meters, exactly pi meters. Now, pi was not supposed to have been discovered yet. In fact, the wheel wasn't even invented in 4500 BC, if you're following the dynastic Egyptian approach to the builders of the pyramid. So yet pi is embedded within the proportions of the Great Pyramid's king chamber down to you know, infinite dis decimal digits accuracy. That's kind of a mind blower. Now, what are the chances of that? Going back to your comment about at some stage, logically, you have to say it seems crazy not to see what we're looking at here, because then you, you start to have a confirmation bias of entropy rather than noticing the pattern. Right. So when you when you start realizing that those alpha omega markings are measured in inches, they're exactly right at the peak of the letter A is at 0.33, the length of the entire sarcophagus. Now, 33 is a Freemason number that's very important in Freemasonry, right? It's sort of the 33rd degree. It's supposed to be the last degree, right? Before you kind of get to the highest level in Freemasonry, but I'm not a Freemason. And I looked at the Omega. That's and exactly I noticed, what a Freemason would say. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not. I'm really not. But the the peak of the of the omega that's right next to it was right at 30 inches. So right at the center of these two, where the serif of the letter A ends, because there's literally a serif on it. And these look, there's a very old patina on it. You can't miss it. There's you if you want to see it, you can find just look up, you know, Alpha Omega Discovery in the Great Pyramid, and you'll find a ton of stuff on this uh, on just Googling it. Now and, and also everything that you're talking about, you put out videos all the time. You have YouTube mm -hmm. videos, you have Instagram videos, you have content on your website showing this stuff. So for everyone who's even just listening to this, if, if you want to actually see the alpha and omega that you discovered, I mean, this content's out there. This is not being made up. So no, it's definitely listen. there. And people have gone after I went who didn't believe me to document it, archaeologists even, and they documented, they're like, holy crap, it is really there. So but when you look at the proportions of this thing, it's 5.6 inches wide. Now, 5.6 inches, you could say, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, 5.605 is the exact measurement. 5.605 squared is 31.4159. It matches exactly. It changes the measurement method from foot to meter. That's why I'm saying all three of the measurement systems 
are built into this great pyramid. And so is, is your, I, I, as we're going to run out of time, I'm like thinking to myself, people are going, who built the damn pyramids guys who I feel you deep divers. First of all, the purpose of the pyramid, your, your belief is what? I believe the pyramid is a reflection of us. Can you elaborate, please? Yes. So Leonardo da Vinci um, has one of his most famous pieces of art is the Vitruvian Man, right? The Vitruvian Man, you would recognize I have one here. It's this thing, right? Vitruvian Man. Yeah, so for people who are just listening to it, it's the the dude who's like got starfish position and he's got his arms in two positions. Like two positions. You had to go there to starfish, didn't you? Starfish. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So Leonardo da Vinci did something very unique with this. He made a circle and he made a square. Now, the square he made is the one that's middle here. It's the one that's marked right at the tip of my finger right here, okay, on both sides. And it's unique because it just barely crests the edge of this circle right here. Okay, and this is a very famous image. And in, in fact, it's probably one of the most iconic images of art that we can find today. Why did he pick that square size that he did? Well, what I discovered on this was not only did I find that if I referenced that upper you know, right-hand corner of his square from the center navel, turns out to be the same slope angle as the Great Pyramid. Exact same slope, which is a very unique number. It's 51.8436 degrees. It's exact. And he's pointing right to it, too. So 51.8436 degrees. Okay, that's speaking something about the Great Pyramid. All right. Well, what about the square that he made? Well, I told you that the Euler number was supposedly, um, supposedly discovered by uh, Sir Isaac Newton, right? But named after a subsequent mathematician. I don't know why he got the name of it, but Leonard Euler. And actually, what we learn is that 200 years before Isaac Newton discovered the number, Leonardo da Vinci encrypted it right inside this exact piece of art. What he did is the, the act of squaring the circle is to find a square with the same area as the circle has as its area. So if you have a radius of one for the circle, then you would have pi, because pi r squared, is the area then of that circle, right? And if you wanted to, to make a perfect square without measurements at all, that's the way the ancient Greeks wanted to always try to do it. That was their challenge. You would have to make a square with an area of pi, right? So you'd have to have a side length that would be exactly without the aid of measurement at all. You'd have to have an area or, or rather a side length that's going to be the square root of pi, right? And then you would have pi as its area. Well, da Vinci didn't do that. Da Vinci gave us a much smaller square. Would you be surprised to know that the exact area of the da Vinci square that he left that has confounded art historians ever since for 500 years is exactly the Euler number? The area is the same Euler number. And now he's giving us a square that's Euler and a circle that's pi. And from this, I later figured out how to derive and be able to solve the riddle of squaring the circle which is finding the exact same energy in perfect balance between masculine and feminine. That's the challenge of it. Da Vinci put it all in here and he pushed us right to this angle up here, which is the exact same as the great pyramid, right? Exactly the same as the great pyramid. So what is it trying to tell us? Well, I believe that what we find also when we look at that Vitruvian man, and Alan Green and I worked on this together, is that if you place the Great Pyramid on top of it and superimpose it on top of the Vitruvian man in the exact right position to do so, it informs each of the locations. So da Vinci made a horizontal line right at the chest right here. He made a line right at the neck. He made uh, vertical lines also in the arms. He made them at the knee here as well. There's little lines here. I don't know if you can see them very well, but there's little lines right here. Those are the exact locations of chambers of the Great Pyramid. Every one of the current chambers match it perfectly. I mean, perfectly. So, so how in the heck is it possible that da Vinci knew, first of all, to encrypt the slope angle of the Great Pyramid within here, to, to take the Euler number, which is one of the great mysteries of the universe at that time, Nobody knew the Euler number. 
and its relationship to gravity and time. And then on top of that, he's given us the location in these 14 separations of this man, which, by the way, he even talks about separating the man up into 14 parts. Well, guess who else was separated up into 14 parts in mythology? Osiris. Osiris was killed by Set and cut into 14 pieces. So this is exactly a representation, right, of an encryption, of a map, of the Great Pyramid itself, where the base of the Great Pyramid is informed by where the navel is, and the Queen's Chamber, and the King's Chamber, and then other unknown chambers that are yet you know, not, not yet found. The, 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 the line at the groin down here is exactly where the subterranean chamber is as well. It exactly matches. So what that says is that there's lines at the neck, there's lines at the, at the crown, and there's lines also right at the uh, pineal gland. So are there then chambers that are located in those exact same spots that are not yet found? And we believe that's true. That yes, they are. And that's what we're going to Egypt to look at. Absolutely. So <laughs> what, what so, Leonardo da Vinci encrypted across all of his pieces of art. Now, we found that you know, there's a whole section in Walter I. book, Leonardo's has gone from me from three and a half, four years. They don't know where he went. He's gone in the historical record. And this guy was famous from the time he was, a, you know, literally a teenager. He was already well known. So nobody knows where he went. There's an account of him going into some cave. So I wanted to understand that. I wanted to dive deeper into that because I knew how da Vinci liked to encrypt things. So I found a letter in a book that he left behind, which is called the Codex Atlanticus. It was a, a, a book of of a compendium of all of his pieces of art that were just sort of like his handwritten notes, right? It was left to Salai and Salai then sold it. it. It ended up going throughout history. And now, you know, it's, it's one of the masterpieces. It has about, I want to say 1400 pages or something. And it. it's quite large. Everything, all the entries, which also was acting sort of like, sort of like a journal for Leonardo were written in backwards mirrored text, all of it, save only a few things. What, is, what now, do you mean by backward smeared? He literally wrote backwards. So, and, and nobody knows exactly why he did it, but all of the notes he would leave in Italian language, he would write as if the only way to read it is to put a mirror in front of it and, and read it the right way forward, right? It was all done in backwards mirrored text. The things that he didn't put in backward mirrored text were those things also we believe were encrypted. So for example, in the upper right-hand corner of Vitruvian Man, you'll find there's a number on the page, even though this wasn't a page, right? Vitruvian Man was a loose leaf. It was, a, it was its own piece of art, but there was a page number at the top that says 126. It's not written backwards. And yet the description of the Vitruvian Man cut into 14 parts like Osiris is written backwards, right? There's a paragraph above and there's a paragraph beneath the Vitruvian Man. So what's the significance of 126? And we know that now it relates to doubling the cube, right? And, and how to move up octaves, go to higher octaves. One to six is the ratio that you have to increase the side length of a cube in order to exactly double its volume. It's necessary in music to replace the major third, which is a five over four interval in Pythagorean tuning. It's 1.25. Change it to 1.26 and you get a perfect doubling of an octave so that the perfect fifths then match up perfectly with the major thirds. So that was one thing we found. Go ahead. You have a question. Well, so with all of this, do you think that there's a, because the, the map, the, the relation to the pyramid and what the pyramid can be, is there a practical application to it? Like, is, was there a, the, uh, do you feel like the pyramids were used for a practical purpose or is it really a, a, just a, a like almost like a, a book, you know, like here's he, what, what, you do know, you here's how I look at it. I see it as the amount to which we understand the great pyramid is directly related to our own conscious progression. So, so that's it's a kind deep, of, 
That's a very deep statement to make, right? But every time I've gone into the pyramid, I've now discovered more things because my eyes of understanding have changed each time. Mm -hmm. So the first time, you know, I went, you were there. I didn't have any big discoveries, but I felt different after. And then right after you might remember that we were out laying on the, on the rocks of the, uh, you know, of, of the Giza plateau. And I look up and we all look, I'm like, do you guys see what I'm seeing? And we saw all this stuff moving around. And there was no, at least for me, there was no drugs involved, right? I had no drugs. There was, there were, I mean, there were like 40 of us there and everyone was aware of what was going on in the sky. Oh yeah. And there were about, I counted 50 or so ships, right. That were up above the pyramids at that exact moment. And we were like 50, we were waiting to go into the next pyramid. If you remember, it was like one o'clock in the morning, super bright moon out. And we're looking at what we thought were stars that started doing formations. Right. And that was a yep. mind blower in of itself, because that's kind of what I thought I was going to get when I went to Egypt too. I was like, man, I'm going to see some alien. I'm going to see some like, alien is a bad word. Now it should be extraterrestrial shit. Do you think that extraterrestrials built the pyramids? Who so built I'll it? tell Let's you my own that experience. Part. Okay. So first of all, I have to start by answering that question by saying, I, I believe that our very concept of time is wrong. So that, that's sort of like, let me just lower the boom on that, right? Because first of all, if you fire a photon into the edge of the universe, in theory, that photon, you know, of go, traveling along that wave propagation, it's not really that it's traveling, but again, just like I described in the stadium, it should loop back on itself like a boomerang. Because the way the universe is shaped, you fire it into its edge as it's growing. Eventually, it'll take a really long time, but it'll come back to you. Well, so should time. Time because and the, light the are related. Of, the edge of existence itself, the parameters as it expands, it has an event horizon. As an event horizon, it's going to come back around and loop back into itself, just like a torus field coming back in, right? Would that assume that time, time is moving? At, it would need to move faster than the speed of expansion to ever catch up to the event horizon? Yeah. So, I mean, the, that's what would have to happen. It would have to be traveling faster than the speed of light, right? In essence, right. in order to avoid that absolute looping back on itself. Yep. But eventually, what my models have basically shown is that what we believe is our distant past might actually be as plausible as our far future. Because now, the future, that's, a lot, to, the that's future, a lot to suck down. The future. So, because well, I've I've heard this theory before as well, which is the pyramids were built in the future, and what we know to be the future, and through the the maybe the structure of the pyramid itself, maybe through what took place when it was built, or the ceremonies that took place in it, or however it could be even just like a blip of some kind that that happened in some perfect way that seems a little too random for that to happen but they, there's some way of figured out where this was left to us as essentially saying hey guys when you figure this whole thing out you're going to be able to go where we went <laughs> so there was a very famous um visitation that happened in rendlesham forest you can find a book by fellow by the name of Gary Osborne. Um, and I happened to live in Rendlesham Forest in, in 1980 when it happened. And so I literally lived in that place. And, and there was a, a, an Air Force base where there was a visitation that occurred. And there was a, a ship and everything. And, and humanoid figures came out of the ship. And military police showed up there and gave an account of it. And one of the people actually touched the ship. And when he touched the ship... He was able to remember a number that came into his head with like tons and tons of decimal digits accuracy. And they wrote it down. They took all of this information after the fact and wrote it all down meticulously. And what's been interesting is the number that he gave was exactly the fine structure constant. Now, at the time, the number of decimals of digits of accuracy on the fine structure constant, which is the separation of light from darkness, by the way, it is exactly the threshold energy required for an electron to either absorb a photon and jump to an outer shell 
or to reflect a photon and stay in its current spot, right? So if you thought about our solar system as like a little gigantic atom, right? In this case, you know, if Earth had a huge solar flare from the sun and all of a sudden it would either absorb that and then jump to the orbit of, say, Mars, right? which would be kind of problematic, I think, for everybody. Or it would just reflect the light itself, which also might be another form of a problem, and it would stay in its same orbital, right? That threshold energy is 137 or 1 over 137. That 1 over 137 comes out to a number that's 0.00729735, right? And it goes on and on. Well, this guy wrote down every digit, and this was in 1980, okay? Every digit that he's written down has actually been identical to each additional digit of accuracy that CODATA, right, which is the group that sort of keeps all of the data of accuracy of things like the fine structure constant value, have continued to mirror match that, okay? Now, when they talked to these so-called visitors, the visitors told them they were not aliens. They said, we're from here. We're just from your future. Now, this is very well documented. Very, very well documented. And these were very similar to accounts that were given of a, a race of humanoids that were called Arcturians. Arcturians describe themselves, even under the auspices of someone like Edgar Casey, who had you know channeled a lot of information about them as a sleeping prophet, saying that they're really just super advanced humans that eventually left Earth but they're from here originally. Now, they're very, very, you know, architectural oriented, apparently, by the reports of them. They're also mathematicians, like incredibly good mathematicians. But they're just like us. They're just future versions of us. So, Robert, we got to wrap this up. But but the the craziest part is, so... We have, if we, if we just think about now, it, it, essentially we are like, okay, if you and I were Arcturians, I'm not saying we're not, but if you and I were Arcturians and we're like, okay, earth is going in a direction that we, we got to go. We got to go. Let's leave the treasure map for them to help them figure this out so that they can get back because we see we see that there is going to be an event, a cataclysm, a regression. A lot of this is going to happen. How can we help them? We're going to leave a map. From this conversation, what I'm taking away from this is there is a possibility that our future left us the map in order for us to develop our creativity, AKA our consciousness, our pattern recognition of uh, mathematics, which is the binary code of the universe, in order for us to elevate our consciousness faster in hopes to maybe avoid the very reason they had to leave the map in the first place. Very true. And so this, this here is just one theory that has come from this conversation that, that mm -hmm. we're proposing, mm -hmm. but backed by one of the smartest humans I've ever met in Robert Edward Grant and by someone who can make words rhyme like myself. And here we are um, having this conversation in, in a way that is, I think, I think that just having this conversation is important for people to realize, Hey, these two dudes aren't crazy. And they're proposing something that actually has some science behind how it could be potentially possible. And two, I now, cause we do need to wrap it up. I want to let people know that we are going to Egypt in October on a trip to follow the maps that you discovered, which people can go and look up mm -hmm. through mathematics in Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, this one, but also in the last supper and um people like we're gonna go do that that's so freaking cool <laughs> like that is <laughs> it, modern day indiana jones meets star wars star portal stargate and meanwhile i want to say that for everyone listening to this you can actually be a part of it virtually and so, Robert, I could talk to you. I, I'm excited that I'm going to get to talk to you way more on the trip and everything. <laughs> um, but I would love 
for you to just speak a little bit about the virtual, like the virtual sure, pass sure, and what, sure. what people can, how they can join us and how much of it they can actually get through, through this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So on the virtual pass, uh, we, we have so many experts with us, uh, Alan Green um, and, and many others, in, including uh, uh, Egyptologists that are going to be with us, Muhammad Ibrahim and Muhammad Zakaria, some of the top hieroglyphics experts, um, and I should just say that on our last trip there last year, just before COVID, like literally we got back one day before the borders closed. So we, we barely made it back in time. We discovered eight stone reliefs inside the King's chamber that we had never seen before. These are now uh, very well uh, understood and documented, but we're going to go back and, and be inspecting them even more. So I'm very excited about this next trip coming up. And one of them was a large cow and a bull inside a cow that matched a cow and a bull inside the Last Supper painting by Leonardo da Vinci. It is our belief that all of the paintings by Leonardo from 1486 onward encrypt this information. And it's encrypted in Rosicrucianism, right? And Rosicrucian comes from the term Rose Cross or Ross Tau, the original name of the Giza Plateau, of which Leonardo was a Renaissance founding member. So, what we understand as well, and I, like I mentioned, we have uh, the letter that he wrote to the Sultan of Cairo describing his visit to Cairo in his own hand and not written in backwards mirrored text. It's written forward. That means it's encrypted. Therein, he describes going inside a giant chamber inside the Taurus Mountain, which is Ross Tau backwards, encrypted. And he says that the mountain was exactly due north, pointing due north, and that it had equal amount of sunlight on each side. It was an encryption for the Great Pyramid, covered in white limestone, shining resplendently. Like literally describes exactly his visit to the Great Pyramid. We believe he had a map. We believe that he encrypted the information of that map inside of all of his paintings from the time that he was in Egypt until the time that he died. All the way up through La Belle Fronière, which is a painting of a woman that has an eye of Horus in the background of it that's quite obvious to see and look at. The Last Supper, the Mona Lisa, the backside of the Mona Lisa, we just analyzed and we found that there is a reference to Thoth on the backside and even the number 432, which is a Pythagorean number. We believe that all of these are parts of a mosaic of information that we are chasing down and following. And the whole purpose of it is to understand, to get into the next chamber. Eventually, we want to be able to get into the next chamber. We know the next chamber is at the throat chakra. That's the chamber that's missing. And by the way, you may not know this, Adam, but when we were there, you, do you remember when we went in the Queen's chamber, there was all this equipment inside there? And it was from this Japanese delegation that had been doing muon scans of the Great Pyramid. The day that we were there, they found a gigantic open chamber above the Grand Gallery that's the same size as the Grand Gallery, which is huge. You could fit an airplane. It's the length of an airplane inside there. So, and then leading to another chamber that would be exactly where the throat chakra chamber is, precisely. So we know that there's already a giant void space there. It's already been proven. So this notion that there are more chambers yet hidden in the throat chakra, uh, and then probably the pineal gland, we believe as well, as well as at the crown chakra is kind of very obvious to us now because we've, we've analyzed this every which way from Sunday. We know that there's stuff already there. What we are doing is on a journey to find ourselves. Because as I said, the degree to which we achieve higher levels of consciousness, the more we see the patterns, the more we see the patterns the higher spiritual ascension we achieve. And as we do that, we'll start to see more and more because all of it is either in higher dimension or requires us to be able to understand higher dimension in order to access it. It's essentially the same but to, to, to ground this in for people. If you don't understand the characters that, of, on, that are written out, you can't speak the language. You Correct. won't even know that that's a language. It won't have any meaning to you. And because 
the language of mathematics is the binary and what's represented to that is the reality that most people experience with when we begin to understand the binary at a deeper level, we're going to be able to see it in our reality. But until we can understand it and, and bring it, it's like being able to see like alpha omega somewhere, but not even notice it because your brain doesn't even recognize alpha omega. You don't know that that's something to pay to notice. So um, on our, on our virtual pass, you're going to be on this journey with us, which we know going in there. Last time we were there, we discovered eight new things. One of them was eight and a half feet wide. It's a huge bull. You can't miss it. But we couldn't see it. All the times I'd been in the King's Chamber, I've spent five nights in the Great Pyramid. I'm going to spend four nights in the Great Pyramid this trip that's coming up. Right? I'm going early and you know I'm going to go one last night as well, just by myself. And I can say that Every time I've gone, I see entirely new things. It's not that the pyramid's changing. I am. And there we go. That's a mic drop. <laughs> that, that's a mic drop moment. And I am honored to be on this trip. And I know that um, I'm not entirely sure yet what my offerings within the virtual pass are going to be, but I know that I will be able to do a little bit of talking and teaching. And um, I, I believe that I'll be able to speak to my experience in my unique way and, and be able to translate what we're discovering and what I'm learning as a, as a humble student into the way that I do. And hopefully all of you deep divers and, and everyone else fans of Robert Edward Grant that are listening to this, um, you know, having the way that it, whether it's poetry or music or, or, or even just through the lens of the imagery and, and the emotion to be able to translate this is a deep honor that, that I uh, get to do. And I'm very, very excited for it. And I encourage you, we have a link. We're going to put a link in the show notes here where you can go and get your virtual pass. So if you're already, you feel it in your system, this is your chance to go to Egypt with us on an Indiana Jones adventure of expanded consciousness. Um, there's nothing else like this. Like this, this is magical. This is really cool that technology allows us to bring you in totally. digitally and virtually for this. And um, yeah, so I encourage you check out the show notes and click the link, get your ticket, get your pass. And Robert, if they want to just find out more about you and, and really dive into your work and what your discoveries, can you let them know where they can do that? Sure. You can go to um, my website. I'm trying to put all my content on my website. Uh, because, you know, it's getting weirder and weirder with all the censorship and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I just had an alchemical drawing that got, that got you know, uh, erased or deleted by Instagram, which is a real bummer. Um, and it had nothing to do with any, I mean, it's kind of mind blowing to me. <laughs> yeah, but, crazy. But, but basically, uh, my website is robertedwardgrant.com. And you can follow me on Instagram, Robert Edward Grant uh, there. Uh, we also have... Uh, two other pages that uh, I'm affiliated with. One is light is consciousness and the other is uh, geometra sagrada. A lot of my work on there is, you know, geometric artwork, et cetera, and mathematics, but um, you know, all of it is tied back to philosophy. And when you ask the question of what's the take home value of all this, the take home value is the greatest encryption of all is you. We are the greatest encryption of all. And being able to see through that encryption and see past the entropy to the pattern answers the very most basic of questions and has the potential to heal all trauma that we've ever experienced. And as I, as I look at this, you know, the, the whole impact, the take home value for all of this is that it's one of empowerment, absolute and utter empowerment. Ascension is not about feeling and realizing you're a victim. It is exactly the opposite. It is about feeling absolutely empowered and knowing the impact that you have on the world around you and that you can have and that you actually are controlling so much more of it than you ever could have imagined. You're just doing it through your lens through which you see the world. If we want to change the world, change the way we perceive the world. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to be the change you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. When there's nothing we, we can do that can have a bigger impact on our entire world experience 
than changing our perception of what's happening, changing the mindset of, oh man, the universe just happened to me to one of, wow, the universe just happened for me. Everything that happens. So it can literally change your entire existence. And, and I encourage you to, to come along with us because I think you'll have a, for me, the reason why I even thought about doing the virtual pass is because I thought eventually everybody needs to come. In this ascension, the only way when you realize that the universe is not a universe as much as it is a you inverse. The reason why the world's a tough place is not because people hate each other. It's because people don't like themselves. Mm -hmm. And we project all around us. All the things we don't like about ourselves, we're so ready to judge in everyone else around us. If we can let that go and just accept ourselves and start accepting everyone else around us as well, that already has a huge impact in changing the world. So the biggest benefit for me with Egypt has been to learn more about who I am. Hmm. And, and we're going to go discover more of who we are in October. And, and everyone, again... Robert is, I could talk, Robert, we, there were so many tangents that I had to let go in order to bring us back to the question. <laughs> yeah, totally. And there's like, even an hour in, I was like, wait, are we answering this question? There's just so much. To well, and the cool discuss. thing about virtual pass is even at night, right? We're going to be doing like, uh, and this is not something that's listed in the virtual, but there's a lot of extra benefits and goodies that are, we're just throwing in as extras. One of them is we've got all these fireside chats on, you know, in the late evenings. Where, where we can have these kinds of conversations and it's going to be available, right, to our groups as well that are on the virtual passes. So it's, it's not that everything has to stay on a structured format. We can kind of dive into deep, you know, difficult, challenging questions. Mm -hmm. and, and I had always thought, what's the best way to do this? Because we're not going to be able to bring ten, tens of millions of people to Egypt and have this experience, but everyone can get a taste for it by joining virtually and we can bring the whole world here. I don't believe that you can really ascend if it's a you inverse by you yourself, by yourself ascending. Everyone's mm -hmm. got to come. And so it is. And Robert, I just got to say thank you for taking the time. I know how busy you are. I think you and I get on a call here shortly um, with the, the, the faculty actually of this yes. trip. Uh, it's an epic planet. faculty too. It's yeah. mind blowing. And Mind so faculty. thank you for the time here. Deep divers again, link is in the show notes to get your pass. Uh, and as always, if you got value out of this and you have some friends that geek out on this stuff as much as we do, please send this to them, share this with your friends and family, tag me in it and tag at the deep dive and tag uh, Robert Edward Grant so that we can reshare your shares and continue growing as a tribe together. I want to remind you that always in all ways you are seen, you are are heard and you are loved. Have a really blessed rest of your day.